Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Hall, and uh, this is our last plenary talk of FCRC 2019. Um, the plenary speakers were nominated by the conferences for their cross-disciplinary impact of their work. Um, the common theme that we've seen this week uh, examines future applications that de demand unprecedented scaling. And today's talk is going to examine how scaling makes possible scientific discovery and some of the, some of the caveats about um, how to adapt applications to new architectures. Today's speaker is Eric Lindahl. He's a professor of biophysics at Stockholm University and a professor of theoretical biophysics at the Royal Institute of Technology. He leads GROMAX, which is an international molecular dynamic simulation project uh, for which he's received several awards, and he also chairs the Prey Steering Committee. And so with that, I'll introduce Eric Lindahl. Thank you so much, Merrick. It's great to be here. I have a ton of slides for you, so I'm going to get started pretty much right away. We've had a number of wonderful keynotes focusing on big data, artificial intelligence, and everything, but I'm going to try to take you back a little bit to number crunching, because that's very much where I'm coming from. Or actually, I'm not even coming from number crunching. I'm a, at heart, I'm still a biophysicist. So what really makes my heart beat is stuff like this. Nerve cells and understanding what's happening in your body. And it's not just figuratively, but literally, because every single heartbeat in your body is due to signaling in these cells. And over the last few years, we've started to understand quite a lot in detail what happens. Um, we know how signals travel as electrical signals inside these ner long nerve cells. And in particular, we know roughly what happens in the so-called synapse, when a signal has to jump from one nerve cell to the next nerve cell. And the synapse itself is super exciting because it's our one chance to somehow influence the whole signaling, which in particular, if you want to design pharmaceuticals to treat neuro any type of neurological disorders and everything, that's the one opportunity we have. The reason we can do this with computers is that over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we've been able to determine structures. So we know what these small receptors that bind the neurotransmitters work like, and we can actually put them in a computer and simulate them. I used to de do this already when I was a PhD student, and I, I don't remember how many months or years I used. You spent an eternity, and eventually, I think in my PhD thesis, I had some like 10 nanoseconds of simulation, which was fun in a way. It taught me about the field and everything. In hindsight, it's an utter embarrassment, um, because today I could probably run that over lunch on my laptop. On the other hand, that also says something about what we can do with current supercomputers and how much biology and chemistry we can do. And that is where my, I'm not sure whether I consider myself cross-disciplinary, but rather somehow anti-disciplinary. I stand with one foot in the physics, the other side somehow in life sciences, and then I guess a third leg in computer science. Computer science is the one thing I've never had any formal training in. Um, and today it's probably 75% of what my group is doing. So what I'm going to take you through a bit is really focusing not so much on the applications, or I forgot this, uh, the obvious applications for this in neurotoxin is any time you're sedated, it's volatile anesthetics, it will strike against these receptors. And if you go out and enjoy yourself tonight after a conference and have a drink, that ethanol is also going to bind and change these receptors. But the tools we use to understand this is based on molecular simulations. That is, that we can with some sort of model, describe a time evolution, and then ask the computer to predict where the positions of these atoms is going to be a very short time later. And I, I tried to look up some statistics on this. I think it's somewhere in the ballpark between 10 and 15% of all the HPC resources in the world are used for molecular dynamics, not only our program. But it says something about how, this, how important this is, not just for the national lab or researchers, but even well, people in doing research in biomedical sciences and pharmaceutical companies. And although we couldn't do a whole lot of this when I was a student, today there are tons of things we can do. So I'm going to tell you two stories here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of how these applications have evolved, uh, where we're coming from. Once upon a long time ago, I was sitting as a PhD student in my advisor's lab and running this on a single deck alpha workstation. And then over the years, we've taken this from Linux clusters to local supercomputers to some of the largest computers in the world, such as K or Summit nowadays. And 
It's a wonderful journey. It's, I hope that it's not over yet. Uh, but we're increasingly seeing that it's leading to some very big challenges as we try to port these to new hardware. So I'm going to share a little bit of that story with you and also point out where the challenges, not just for this application, but broad classes of applications are on the so-called exascale. And the other story then is really if we take a step back and see what are the scientific computing challenges in general as we move to the exascale. Um, there are all these prefixes, right? We were at the giga scale, we were at the tera scale, we were at the peta scale. The exascale is fundamentally different, I would argue, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, I'm not saying that it's the end of scaling, but I think it's the end of a whole lot of things we've taken for true for a very long time, at least in the scientific applications. Molecular dynamics is actually a dirt simple problem. Um, it's at least if you do this classically, which we tend to do, um, you could describe my entire life, uh, which is that in my flow diagram with five boxes. And that the type there is a bit small, but basically we start with some sort of state that we typically get from an experiment. Then we need to calculate all the interactions between these particles that we tend to do with classical potentials. And then we update the coordinates, and then we just repeat this again and again and again and again. And the reason why this works, or the parts that we emphasize here, is really statistical mechanics. Rather than going for the most accurate representation of one molecule, that would mean quantum chemistry, we rather focus on large molecules such as proteins or even larger collections of cells and everything that move. And in that case, it's important for us to sample more than one confirmation. So we frequently compromise a bit with the accuracy and use these classical interactions, uh, very simple models, springs, balls. Um, traditional Coulomb electrostatics, nothing quantum anywhere near here. Uh, and then we use typically Newton's equations of motions to update this. This is not perfect. We certainly ignore a whole lot of quantum phenomena, but if you look in a protein, for instance, it's very rare that we break any bond, and we're very rare that we form any bonds, so that it works surprisingly well. And what this does by us, even though it's fairly expensive to calculate all these pairwise interactions, this is orders of magnitudes. And when I say orders of magnitude, you should probably think like 10 orders of magnitude cheaper than doing it with quantum chemistry. So this means that we can actually cover realistic timescales. I can do it at finite temperature, and I can do it with water and everything to really mimic a biological experiment, which is completely out of the question with quantum chemistry for now. The problem, though, is that on the atomic scale, things move fast. So you need to take time steps in the ballpark of femtoseconds or so. And if you're going to get anywhere interesting whatsoever, the water wobbling there in the background might be great fun if you're interested in the physics of hydrogen bonds or something. But if you want to study proteins or anything in your cell, we're going to need to get this to microseconds or even milliseconds. And you're going to need a huge amount of steps here. And here is the curse. And this is the sequential part of it. Every step depends on the previous step. So I'm going to need to calculate one step as quickly as I can, I'm very much focusing on latency, so that I can calculate the next step. And this is going to turn out to be a curse on modern supercomputers. The reason why this is a curse is that if you look at a small system here, a um, tiny box here, if you take something slightly larger, like one of these ion channels I showed or something, we might have 100,000 atoms. The problem is I can't pick another system. I'm interested in a particular ion channel, so I can't pick something that's larger that would scale better. And this system, if I ignore things, if I only account for things close in proximity, each atom might have 500 neighboring atoms I should take into account. And then if you do a bit of mathematics here, you maintain a list, uh, you end up with something in the ballpark of 50 million interactions per step. And with the typical interactions we have, that might be roughly 2 billion floating point operations which is certainly a lot of floating point operations, or rather, it used to be a lot of floating point operations. This is nothing nowadays. So the problem here really is that I hardly have enough floating point operations. Uh, what you see here out here is our big cur our kernel, and it's very simple, because this is where we spend 90% of the time, calculating one over the square root of a square distance, so I get one over r to calculate Coulomb's law. It's embarrassing what fraction of my career I spent just trying to optimize that function. But to reach the time scales here, we need this to compete in way under a millisecond. And this is the problem as we're becoming more and more parallel with current computers. So why don't we scale up the system? Well, scaling up the system would certainly enable me to scale better, right? But I wouldn't necessarily need, reach longer time scales. 
And when it comes to the biology here, the problem is as long as I'm stuck on femtoseconds or picosecond scale, I'm doing physics. I might be able to get some sort of chemistry when I move down to nanoseconds or something, but to really understand motions in these molecules, understanding what's happening when you're having that drink, we need to reach at least something like a microsecond, ideally a microsecond per day. We're not quite there yet. If you want to get further, if you want to have some sort of predictive properties here, we probably need at least another order of magnitude. And if we really, if biochemists are going to trust computers to replace their experiments, we probably need another order of magnitude above that. And the green part down here, that's the pipe dream. That's likely not going to happen. Why is that not going to happen? It's an iterative algorithm. And the problem with these iterative algorithms, again, 400 microseconds per step, that's doable. It's hard, but it's doable. 43 microseconds per step. I think that what I'm going to show you today will take us to 40 microseconds per step. But here it starts to become really difficult. At 400 nanoseconds per step, this is probably just a number to you, but in 400 nanoseconds, light does not even travel 100 meters. And if you're then going to communicate like 20 or 30 times, just start counting the length of those infiniband cables and everything. Even if my code did not take any time whatsoever to run, even the hardware was perfect, there is simply not enough speed for, there's not enough time for the light to travel as far as we would like to communicate. So no matter how good we are here, no matter how much work, um, within a few orders here, we're going to hit some very hard walls in terms of physics that is going to make it impossible to scale further. And if we would hope to scale up to a zeta scale machine, that's simply not going to work. If you look at what these algorithms do, and I so don't expect to look at the details here, it turns out that that simple flow chart is way too simplistic. Um, so to optimize things, you tend to separate things that are independent and everything, and it turns out you end up with a ton of small communications. So in this, every red item here is a communication, and if we do it in a flow chart here, every single small gray, uh, gray arrow here is communication. So we might have 10 or 20 communication steps in every step. And remember, those steps should take less than a millisecond. So that we're way down in the hundreds of, uh, well, tens of microseconds per communication event or something, which is getting tough, because networks are not improving at all quite as fast as computers. So what do we do about this? Well, GPU acceleration. This is actually a real GPU that we have run Gromax on. Um, there was a poor PhD student at Stanford of Pat Hanrahan's. Ian Buck, when I was a postdoc at Stanford in the time, uh, we came up with this idea that maybe, just maybe, we can run number crunching codes on GPUs. And this poor student spent nine months porting all my kernels to this GPUs. And this was very much a cross-disciplinary project because Pat, Pat Hanran is a professor of computer science. I, at the time, I hadn't even touched computer science, so I had no idea. And then we were sitting, Ian eventually got all this code working, um, and then we were sitting in the room and discussing where to send this. And I think Pat said that we should send this to SIGGRAPH or something. And then I said, but this is good work. Can't we send it to a real journal? Um, which I can. Since then, I've kind of learned that conferences are more important than journals in computing science. Uh, but that's one of the fun aspects of being cross-disciplinary. This poor student, uh, these kernels never appeared in Gromax because they, were, they worked, but they were a factor 20 slower than running on the CPU. But this poor student got a decent job anyway because he's now vice president at NVIDIA, responsible for all CUDA and acceleration. <laughs> and the reason why GPUs are tempting is that if CPUs are parallel, every small green dot here is a functional unit. And this is an old GPU. Actually, this is also an old GPU because they keep updating them so frequently. So it's pointless to update this slide because you can't even see the individual green dots here anymore. There are like 6,000 computing units, or whatever you call them, processor elements or something, on a single GPU. And these you can buy for $499, which is pretty tough competition. Uh, but as a scientist, I like that pricing. The only problem is that you can't use them. They're completely useless. There was a reason why they were 20 times slower than CPUs, right? Because these will only work if you have a data parallel algorithm that they can all ideally use exactly the same type of data. And that's not how algorithms work in molecular dynamics. To tell the truth, that's not how algorithms work in most scientific applications. Uh, which, at least in Sweden and Europe, it's the reason why the number of large supercomputers that have been turned over to accelerators is probably still less than 10%. Uh, scientists are stubborn or stupid because we don't do our homework in porting things. 
So there are a couple of different ways we can look into these acceleration approaches. If you're really lucky, uh, you can use something like GPU libraries. Uh, if you just happen to have a code that does this, it's amazing because you can get the vendors to do the homework for you. Unfortunately, we don't have an algorithm that's present in libraries. You could use something like directives, OpenACC, OpenMP. Today, that's probably what I should have tried. Um, but when we started doing this, OpenACC was not mature enough, and we couldn't, even when it started to appear, we couldn't access the deep, deep dungeons of the hardware where we were gone. You could do pure CUDA. We do a whole lot of pure CUDA. Um, it's okay. The only problem is that you end up with huge amounts of CUDA code. Thousands of lines, tens of thousands of lines, hundreds of thousands of lines, and at some point you have one million lines of CUDA code. That's great if you only ever use NVIDIA hardware. But if in the US, the computer I showed on the first slide is made by AMD. There are now a lot of research groups crying blood <laughs> because they spent 10 years optimizing everything for CUDA, and they're now gonna have to port everything again. So what we have increasingly moved to is heterogeneous CPU, GPU acceleration, where we use both the CPU and the GPU. That will look really stupid in some ways, but I'm arguing, I think that's where we all should head. The big problem here is the initial effort and expertise required. This hurts a lot um, to learn. And again, I'm not a computer scientist. I've had to learn, it's very much been on the job training for me. But I think if you just pay that initial price, everything else looks really beautiful. And it creates performance code that is quite maintainable. And the reason why this code is maintainable is mainly that instead of running everything on the GPU that a whole lot of codes do today, well, that works. Um, the only problem is that it also limits you a bit. If you're only gonna run things on one GPU, I can then just use parameter scanning or some training where you have lots of GPUs do training or inference in parallel, then it works great. But remember, my algorithms, one step depends on the previous step. So I can't run hundred thousands of GPUs in parallel. And that means that the GPUs will now have to talk to each other. And there are some architectures such as MVLink where you can have a few GPUs talk to each other in a node. But the second the GPUs are in different nodes, you're now gonna need to move, either go over the CPU or at least try to do MPI on the GPU. And this very quickly becomes very complicated, in particular because I also have a whole lot of bookkeeping to do to do neighbor searching and everything. So what we have increasingly done instead is that try to stay a bit on the CPU. Um, so we use something like OpenMP on the CPU, we'll do the CPU, we'll do all the complicated bookkeeping, anything that has to do with random memory accesses, where we can do every single trick we want. Um, trick is a dangerous word in climate science, at least nowadays, but for us, these tricks are usually smart algorithms that means that we can do fewer floating point operations. And then we just offload the most expensive part to a GPU. That works very well if we accelerate the CPU, and then we just run either CUDA or OpenCL on the accelerator devices. We can have a node with two GPUs, that works perfectly fine, they typically have two sockets, um, or I can of course also decide to overload the GPUs, sorry, overload the CPUs or start to parallelize not just between three or nine, but say even a hundred nodes this way. This is gonna be a challenge because for everything I'm gonna to need to do here, this GPU will have to communicate to that CPU, that CPU will have to send a message to the next node, and then the next node will have to communicate to the GPU. But if the hardware is fast enough, this just might work. Uh, this is somehow called the easy programming model when NVIDIA presents it. Uh, if this is the easy one, I'm very happy they didn't pick the difficult one. So what we started to do First, together with Ian Bach and others, just look at these algorithms, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of these flowcharts. Don't worry about the details, but typically we have one CPU thread here and one GPU thread here. Um, so part of the work we do in the CPU, and then we do a bunch of communication steps, uh, but here in the middle we have the traditional compute part, actually, the laser is wearing out here. So in the middle you have the traditional compute bound part. And in this algorithm, we know our algorithms so well, so I could have guessed this without any profiling. It's all these Coulomb and van der Waals interactions where we're calculating interactions between atoms that are just close in space. Those are reasonably easy to offload to the GPU. We send things over to the GPU as quickly as we can. The GPU does its job. In the meantime, though, um, the CPU doesn't necessarily have to be idle because we can let the CPU do some of the cheaper computations, and then we just hope to get the GPU work back in time. And when we first started doing this, we were so disappointed because the GPUs were so slow, so we always ended up waiting for the GPU. 
The other problem, though, is that, and I think this is the real challenge, both for us and a whole lot of other codes, why we haven't moved more to accelerators, that scientists have been smart. Um, I'm not talking about me, but the previous generation, that there is a wealth of amazing algorithms developed to optimize things for CPUs. And those are great algorithms, but remember, the algorithms are optimized for CPUs. So in any type of molecular simulations or non-bonded interactions, pairwise interactions, we tend to create lists of neighbors so that for each atom here, be it particle number three and four, there is a list of what are the atoms that are close in space to atom number three or atom number four. And in general, those will of course be different. There are also gonna be different numbers of atoms close in space, but atoms eight, atom nine is in all three lists here. This works great on a CPU because you look up an entry in this list, you compute the force, and then you write it back. On GPUs, not so much, because the problem here on the GPUs is that GPUs require many elements to do the same operation just on different types of data. But this is gonna be complicated because they can't all write data to atom nine at the same time here, because atom nine here is gonna have updates from all three of them. There are some tricks we could do that. We could, of course, create a gigantic matrix. If I have n atoms, this would be an n square matrix. And then every single element of this matrix would be, say, four by four or eight by eight tile. And then I would literally calculate every single interaction against every single other interaction in the system. This is what you see in almost every beginner book of CUDA showing how to accelerate things. It's an amazing way to get high floating point rates, and it's an absolutely horrible way to do simulations because it scales as n squared. Nobody would have been that stupid. That's why we came up with those, well, that's why Berlay came up with those algorithms in the 1960s. And what has struck us over and over again is that we have to go back and revisit these fundamental algorithms that had you asked me 20 years ago if there was one thing that would never change in my field, I would have said it's this algorithm. The Verlay link cell algorithm will never change. And we've had to revisit it uh, because it does not work on modern hardware. So what we ended up doing on modern hardware instead is that we had to come up with algorithms that were both fast, but they, they should both achieve high floating point rates on the GPU, but I don't want to throw out the baby with the water. I don't care about floating point rates. I care about simulation performance. So instead of doing the traditional approach here where we just grid things, um, the reason for gridding things is to come up with an n log n algorithm. And then you'd up with these grid cells that some grid cells might have five atoms, some might have three, and some might have four. And that is exactly this problem. Everything, I don't end up with tiles that are four by four or eight by eight. So you can adjust these algorithms just so slightly by only grid things in two dimensions, and in the third dimensions we would then bin it so that I always have exactly four atoms per cell. So these cells are no longer going to be uniform and beautiful in space, but I don't really care. It works great anyway. So from my original molecules on the top left, I end up with some sort of completely artificial tetrahedra. And then I, if one atom in a tetrahedron interacts with another atom in another tetrahedron, the entire two tetrahedra interacts. So this means that I recover this four by four interaction in this case, but I only do that for the ones that are actually within range which gets important if it's 100,000 or a million atoms. So this again scales as n log n, but they will still work on GPUs. And when we first start to do this, you cry. Because I spent the vast majority of my career trying to remove floating point operations. There are an entire generation of scientists, at least those of you who are older know what I talk about, that the fastest floating point operation is a floating point operation we don't calculate. But the problem with these algorithms, we end up with a huge amount of floating point operations that are wasted. Everything that's purple there is a floating point operation that would have been better if I could have avoided. So I'm wasting 50% of everything I calculate. And this is where I would be so embarrassed that I would just put a brown paper bag over my head and resign. But the amazing thing is that GPUs are so fast that it's anyway a factor of three faster. And this is the other hard memory here, that again, I spent my entire career thinking that everything is limited by floating point operations. Forget about that. On GPUs, everything is memory. To first approximation, you have an infinite amount of floating point operations, which is very hard to learn. And I keep making that mistakes again and again, that I think we're floating point limited. But this worked quite well for us. Uh, the other neat thing is that when you do this things way with heterogeneous acceleration, uh, we have very little architecture-specific code. I think it has grown a little bit since I made this slide, but we have some like 10 files that contain CUDA, and it's roughly 3,500 lines 
out of three million lines that are raw CUDA. And this worked so well, so there was even a company online that contacted us called, uh, and helped us write OpenCL kernels. They did this kind of a pro bono thing and probably to show that they're good at OpenCL. So now we have OpenCL acceleration too. So we're gonna work on that AMD Frontier system when it comes online. And any other system that's gonna come online the next year or two. So on the one hand, this makes us um, reasonably happy. Um, there are a couple of reasons why I very much like heterogeneous acceleration. I'm gonna try to convince you why this is the way to go. Uh, you could, of course, say that you should stick entirely to CPU, but that would be the same thing as in the 1980s, that you had this Intel processors. They did not have a floating point unit. You could, of course, emulate floating point if you absolutely needed it, but most office apps didn't. Or you could say that you're only doing number crunching, you don't really only care about the floating point unit, that would be the 287 coprocessor. Um, this is old chips, you could plug it in physically. But that's equally stupid, of course. Nobody would write a loop variable in a floating point. And since the last 20, 30 years, uh, every single modern processor has a floating point processor built in, of course, and not just one, probably two or even four units. And the way we see this is that you call them GPUs, accelerator, whatever, these are very much merging with processors. You're gonna have processors that contain sets of latency-focused units, kind of like traditional CPUs, and other sets of units that are throughput-focused, that would be the accelerator-based ones today. But if you give this 10 years, they're gonna be sitting on the same chip, there is no PCI Express bus between them and everything, and you should simply decide, you should send the integer units to the integer unit and the floating point to the floating point unit, and same thing with latency versus throughput bound jobs. What this gives you in scientific applications is that rather than focusing entirely on the floating point, use the CPUs for all these complicated bookkeeping, these fancy neighbor searching algorithms I showed you and everything, uh, or if you're gonna do fancy parallelization. Parallelization, if you can limit the amount of data you send over, you're gonna do better, but that frequently means complicated gridding algorithms and everything that the GPU is not at all good at. The CPU is, on the other hand. So use the CPU for the communication and ideally, in the meantime, you should be able to use the GPU too. Uh, and the take home message here is very much the bottom line here, that rather than seeing things as a GPU or CPU, a modern computer is a collection of devices. This actually holds for the CPU too. But think of you have a network device, maybe more network devices, you might have IO devices, you have traditional CPU devices, you have accelerator devices, and ideally you should try to use all of these to solve your problem as efficiently as possible. Which initially is difficult, but long term it's frequently a help. The problem that what happens when we do it this way is that we very quickly run out of work. Remember, that is the opposite, as I said. Historically, we were always short of floating point operations. And what's happening now is that these accelerators are so darn fast that they run out of work because I send my work to them and it's not even enough work to keep them busy. These are complicated plots, but what this basically means is that I need something like 100,000 atoms for a GPU before the GPU is saturated. Uh, otherwise, the, cur the amount of execution time I use per particle goes up. So this whole regime here to the left and the right-hand side basically shows that I'm not saturating the GPUs. And 100,000 atoms doesn't sound so bad until you realize that was the entire size of the systems I wanted to simulate. So I can't even use, I can use one system with one GPU instead of hundreds of them. And this is still limiting us entirely. We can't, to get strong scaling, I would need to get this down to 1,500 atoms or something, and we're nowhere near there yet. Um, so we've become latency bound in the sense that the, the time the driver takes to issue the kernels on your accelerators is too long. Not for one GPU, mind you. For one GPU, it works fine. But if I want to use 1,000 GPUs, I simply run out of work. And that's, again, the curse of having spent 30 years removing work, floating point operations. I have some ideas, I'm gonna show you how to solve this. Um, we can come up with smarter ways of trying to hide the latencies. Um, so again, if you have these flow charts and if you run in parallel, one thing that happens is that there are different types of work. I have some local work that's already present on my node. I don't need to wait for communication to do that. So I can let the GPU have two streams so that I first start to chunk along and do computation on locally available data. While the, while the CPU is doing communication to other nodes. 
The second that remote data is present, uh, we have a non-local bonded interaction here. So what this basically gets a high priority signal sent, and then I immediately try to calculate all this data so I can send it back to where it came. And then while I'm waiting for communication, I can chew along and do my local data. This works quite well. We gain a factor of two on it, and this is what's required to get us below one millisecond. So with this, we are down to scaling to maybe 10, down to t only 10,000 atoms per accelerator device or something. But that still just means that we can go to four or eight GPUs, which is not good enough. Sorry, yes, uh, let's basically show the remote data. And the problem here is really that we're bumping into Amdahl's law. Um, I, well, I had heard of Amdahl's law, but it's, again, it's one of these embarrassing things. You've heard of it, and then you keep forgetting it. Um, so after 10 years, we, we're just banging our head against Amdahl's law, and you're not gonna win that battle. The, one way or another, we need to push more work on the accelerator, because those same accelerators that were so slow that we were cursing them when we started, something happened, because now suddenly the accelerator is 10 times faster than the CPU, so the accelerator is always waiting for the CPU instead. And that means that we increasingly have to move more work to the accelerator, and more work to the accelerator, and more work to the accelerator. This does work. Yeah, you can find other algorithms. Uh, this is say, an algorithm called PME that you use to do long-range interactions. I won't go into details on how we did it, but it works quite well to offload that into a third stream, and you can even do four streams here. And one advantage of having multiple streams is that I avoid doing them sequentially. It takes a while for each stream to start executing, but this way they can all start in parallel. And with this, we get another factor two or three speed up, which again, a factor two speed up doesn't sound amazing, but I used to say in my lab, whenever a new student came in, I used to mutter say, well, if you can speed up my code by 2%, I will buy a bottle of champagne. And I only did that once for the people doing GPU stuff. <laughs> Uh, because the problem, they come back and realize we didn't speed it up by 10%, we spent it up like a factor of two. And then you wait a year, and then they spit it up by another factor of two. And this is both horrible and beautiful in a way, because this is, of course, how science is supposed to work. We thought that we were at the limits of what the hardware could do, and then we have these students that are a factor of four smarter than we were. But then it comes to really, I think. If there was one thing I know well, it's how to program a CPU. I think I wrote one, no, I think I wrote 700,000 lines of x86 assembly when I was a PhD student. If you haven't done that, do it at some point, because it's a great way of learning what a computer looks like. Once you've done that, don't do it again, um, because it, it's completely horrible code that is unmaintainable, and for a long time, there was a pride in my life that I was better at scheduling register allocation than the compiler. And then the compiler was equally good. And then the compiler became better at me the scheduling registers. And then I, I'm not gonna look through 700,000 lines of code and try to reschedule my registers because there are now more registers available. Then we ditched that and went back to the compiler. But still, on the CPU, we should just avoid floating point calculations, right? Well, it's not so easy because a modern CPU does not look like a CPU used to do when I was young. Even a single core on a modern CPU, it's full of all these complicated devices and units, uh, but even any normal, and now I'm talking about laptop devices, they will have at least two, if not three, heavy floating point units. These floating point units can handle not just one instruction, but they have the single instruction, multiple data, so they can issue one instruction that operates on four, eight, or 16 floating point numbers. That's a lot of floating point operations for one, say 64 flops in single precision, maybe but that's in one core. Even a last generation Skylake, they have say, like maybe 32 cores per chip, and then you have two such chips per node. So that would mean roughly 4,000 floating point operations per cycle per node. That's last generation. The new chips Intel just released, they're improving this by a factor of two. So you're having 8,000 fold parallelism on one node on the CPU side of a modern computer. If you Sitting and thinking, you're considering whether your code is parallel enough for that, I can kind of, it's very unlikely that your code expresses 8,000 fold parallelism, and that's before you're even considering parallelizing over two nodes. So CPUs, in a way, they have grown very much like, look like a mini cluster. Um, again, this is not even a high-end CPU in Leffe. It's an Intel one with, I think, 18 cores, and you kind of have two ring topologies. You have complicated networks, you have multiple dice, 
this starting to look like really complicated maps. I think that my first cluster was simpler than the die on a modern uh, CPU looks like. So that internally, a modern CPU looks much more like an accelerator than the CPU did when I was a student. So in theory, we might be able to just take all those algorithms that we developed for, CPU, for GPUs back to the GPUs, and it might not hurt performance that much, which would, of course, certainly simplify that way the code maintainability. Uh, did I say not hurt performance so much? Well, it turns out that you can optimize this entirely to the type of SIMD units you have and everything. So this ended up being a factor of 30% faster than the CPU code I spent 10 years developing. Uh, there are a bit of complications here because you need to suddenly start altering the entire algorithms. You have to change your buffer sizes depending on how wide these units are and everything in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through that. But again, it's the same problem here that to really reap the benefits of all this hardware, you need to take a step back and accept that you have to change your algorithms a bit. Because if you want your algorithm to be fixed, you're not going to get any of these advantages. The other thing that we came up with that if floating point operations are so cheap that we have an infinite amount of them, couldn't we try to use that? So normally we would try to minimize the only reason for having these buffers. Um, you see there on the left that in principle, I only want to calculate the interactions inside the solid red circle. But if I only update this list of neighbors every 10 steps or so, some of them might diffuse in, right? So I need to have a bit of an extra buffer zone to account for particles that might move in over the next 10 steps. But if I had an infinite amount of floating point operations, I could have a gigantic buffer zone there and make this two or three times larger. And that would, of course, mean lots of wasted floating point operations. But that's not so bad. And what it would gain me in return is that I would not have to update the neighbor lists so much. And it turns out on modern hardware, calculating a neighbor list is random access in memory. It's much more costly than just calculating the interactions. But the other thing that we can do if you have that long neighbor list, every few steps we could stop and basically sit down and check what our neighbor list is and try to create a smaller neighbor list. We call it that we prune the neighbor lists. And this actually works great, even on a CPU. On a CPU, we get a factor of 20% or something from this. On a GPU, it's a factor of two. And what, of course, would be really amazing, imagine that I had an idle device in my system that if this was a device that was really good at floating point numbers and for part of the step or something, this device was not doing anything else, I could just tell this device to, if you don't have anything else to do, here is a unit of work. Take this neighbor list and start pruning it. If you're not done, it doesn't matter. Stop immediately because then I'm going to have higher priority work for you. But when you're idle, you can try to optimize things for the next step. And of course, we have such devices, um, GPUs in particular. Uh, so what we do now with GPUs is that anytime the GPU is idle because the CPU is integrating or communicating, we're using the GPU to optimize our data structures ahead of the next step so that we'll be able to do better at the next step. And this gave us another 50%. So somewhere now, although we, where we started out, we were a factor 20 slower by using GPUs at the start. Now we're roughly one order of magnitude faster the second I add an accelerator. And although those accelerators are not cheap, in particular if you buy the professional ones, but for us there is no question now. We do everything based on accelerators. The problem, though, that no matter how good these accelerators are, you end up with problems. At some point, when we get down to these 100 microseconds per step, we don't have enough work for the accelerators to do. We end up wasting all our time in the latencies, and things simply will not scale anymore. Uh, these are some of the most expensive networks you have on the craze and everything, but even there, we have to give up. Or do we have to give up? Can we find other things to do? Well, maybe we can. Uh, Instead of doing that one-dimensional flow chart, we can start to write things like task graphs. So that every single square here is a small task. That could be calculated non-bonded interactions or integration. And every arrow here is a dependency on the data. This is very popular now in particularly CUDA, and I, I, I would imagine a whole lot of you are computer scientists are far better than this than I am. But by reformulating our entire algorithms as graphs, uh, we remove a whole lot of those global synchronization points. You could imagine doing this once per step, and then we do a second step, but doing it once per step still means that we have this nasty synchronization point in the middle, and that's what we would like to get rid of. 
So the obvious way to do this is that if I have my atoms, and this might be 100,000 atoms on a node or something, but group those in smaller parts. You can have the, the first four, the second four, the third four, and the, the last quarter of the atoms here. If I already know the forces on those four atoms, I could send that on to the next step and integrate them and update them. Because if I know all the forces on that atoms, I can start processing them while I'll still calculate the forces on this atoms. So what this enables us to do is break the entire sequential approach. Um, so that you can have some parts of the system working on step two or even step three, while other parts of the system is falling one step behind. And since we're at very high levels of parallelism, we constantly have a bit of jitter in the system from other jobs and everything. This turns out to do miracles for the scaling. Um, what we would also like to do this now, to combine this both with accelerators and the CPUs and everything, in theory, this is great. There's only one problem. There are still no frameworks whatsoever available that can do this on the latency levels we need. There are beautiful graphs libraries out there, but we need these graphs libraries to be scheduled on a microsecond latency when we execute each task. And if any of you have any idea how to solve this, uh, I would be so interested in it, because then we're going to start using it. Because for now, we have to code all of this manually. And I bet we're not going to be the only application hitting this brick wall. But what this has done, compared to when I was a student, to tell the truth, halfway through my PhDs, I was thinking of quitting or changing subject because there is, n there is no way these algorithms will ever be able to tell anything real about chemistry and biology. Thank God I was wrong. Um, and this is not just due to us. Some of this is my students' work, but I'm going to show you some of the field that these are examples where we use molecular simulations, for instance, to study the stratum corneum of the skin and determine the entire structure of the lipid layers that are responsible for the barrier getting into the skin. And once you do this, we can model this based on cryo-electron microscopy data. Then you have an entire approximate but re de reasonable models of what the skin looks like. And when you do this, you can create systems with different modifiers or test different molecules and see how expensive is it for a particular model to go through skin. Now, of course, the whole point of skin is that it should not let molecules through, but some molecules will have a greater ability than others to go through skin. And what you would like to do this for is develop better skin patches. So if you're in drug design and everything, if you are designing a drug, by far the best drug is that you can deliver it through a transdermal patch because you don't need needles. Uh, it's cheap, the patient won't be bothered, and it's actually a low continuous dose that is better in every single way. The only problem is that there are virtually, there's less than one in a million chemicals that will do that spontaneously. So these are the two students of mine behind this. They actually went on to start a small company where they're now trying to sell this as consultancy service and optimizing compositions of these patches and everything so that they can predict what chemicals will be suitable to form transdermal patches. And I'm, I'm in shock and all that it works. People are using simulations to study things like cellulose and lignin that is super important for, say, biofuels and everything and understanding if you have microcellul nanocellulose Sweden in particular, Sweden in particular, we have a whole lot of forest industry and this is super important for them. These, we love these systems because given their size, they scale amazingly well. We run them up to four or 500 nodes of Pittsteins, which is still the sixth largest computer in the world. Uh, and my particular pet subject, these ion channels that I talked about, today it is not, it's virtually impossible for a group to publish an experimental structure on an ion channel unless they've also included a simulation. I'm not sure whether I entirely agree with that, but I'm looking in hindsight, it's a completely different world. Because when I started, simulations was kind of something like the cat dragged in. So on the one hand, this makes us happy. But we still have the problem that there is no way this is going to scale to Summit, the largest systems in the world. This is an old slide, and I've, I've updated it, but I haven't changed anything. This is a Jaguar, and once upon a time it was an ice computer, it's since long retired. Roughly at the same time, you had Eugene, which is a 300,000 core machine in Europe. And if you just take these machines and apply Moore's law, we had 300,000 cores around 2010, almost a decade. And then we just scaled this up. 2014, we had Sequoia, uh, 3 million cores. 2016, we would have something like 10 million cores, and we actually had pit steins, um, not quite cores. There were some sort of processor elements on GPUs, but the point is, Moore's law appears to hold. You get more functional units. 2018, 30 million cores. Uh, I think we just missed that benchmark. In 2020, we're supposed to have 100 million cores or elements. We beat that. Um, Summit had 125 million elements, and if you see the rumors, there are these rumors saying that the Chinese actually have a machine that's twice as fast as Summit, but they didn't dare to put it on top 500. 
due to the trade negotiations. And if you just keep doing this extrapolation, I'm fairly confident this will hold. So somewhere around 2024, the largest machines in the world will contain one billion functional elements. And I see quite a few of you are young here. Um, that's five years from now on. You're not gonna have tenure by 2024. So if you're gonna be in computer science and if you argue that your work is gonna be relevant, there's pretty much only one question you should ask yourself. And that is, how are you gonna use a billion cores? Uh, if you only scale to one million cores, they will likely not even let you on these systems because you're only using 0.1% of it and then you're not gonna be considered to scale sufficiently well. And this is a bit humbling. Um, I have to confess, I'm not sure how my jobs will be able to use a billion cores. Uh, but I see, again, if anything, that we're ahead of this curve rather than behind it. I suspect that what's gonna happen is that somebody will come up with the idea that we can just scale up. We can have a gigantic system. Let's simulate an entire cell that's gonna be a trillion atoms or something. I have developed a special type of time machine technology in Stockholm, so I'm actually gonna predict what the result of that simulation is. So if you look very carefully here, this is gonna be the end result, because we can certainly simulate a trillion atoms for one nanosecond. And if you know anything about cells, absolutely nothing happens that involves an entire cell in one nanosecond. So the end result is gonna look exactly the same as the starting confirmation, but I bet it's gonna be on the cover of a glossy journal in five or 10 years. But if you're actually interested in science, that's pointless. We need to take these small systems and get them to cover longer scales in time instead. And at the same time, that's the speed of light. We can't get them to do that. Well, what we are increasingly looking at, I think a whole lot of other people do, is ensembles. Um, and there are a whole range of algorithms here, but I'm in particular gonna focus on one technique that we have come to love, and it's called Markov state models. Uh, because it's not just brute force embarrassing parallelism that we certainly could do too in many cases. So if you look at a small protein moving, this is the villain headpiece. This was the largest simulation. In 1998, the first microsecond simulation was done in this protein by using the largest supercomputer in the US for three months, the entire machine. It's a tour de force result. But even this so-called native state, you see that it's moving around a bit and adopting slightly different conformations. That's natural, it's room temperature, so it should do that. But maybe we could classify those. So if you start, took this protein and just started lots and lots of simulations, completely independent ones at first, make them fairly short. Uh, and then we stop the computer after a few hours and see, are some of these ending up in the same place? Maybe we can form some sort of clusters here. And based on those clusters, maybe there are three macroscopic large states that correspond to slightly different conformations. That works really well, actually. Uh, and we can do it slightly more mathematically than that. The whole idea with the Markov state model is the Markov process in physics is just the keyword for the simplest process you can imagine. It has no memory. The only thing that matters is where you are. So you might, if you are in the red state, there is a certain probability you would become blue and another probability you would become yellow, but there is no influence of history. So if that works, if you are in a state here, we could say what is the probability that I will stay in that state or what's the probability that I will go over to another state and then the probability of staying in that state, et cetera. Now, if we continue that, at some point I have lots of transitions between red and yellow and if I continue these simulations, at some point I might identify a new state, the green one. And then I will be able to calculate the transition probability to the green because I now can choose to focus, start lots of simulations from the green and red states. At some point I will find a white state here and then I can choose to emphasize white, green and yellow in other simulations. So it's no longer brute force. I can choose to bias my simulations to be in the outskirts of what I've sampled this far. And as I continue here, I'm not gonna go, uh, draw 10,000 of these, but this works remarkably well. And here the scaling is not 100%. The scaling we get for these for small systems is typically two to 300% because I'm not doing brute force. I'm focusing my sampling on the parts of phase space that I've not yet sampled. And what this really gets me, it's not just a beautiful movie of where the protein is moving, but I, do, I literally get the entire landscape, I get the entire kinetics, I get what is the probability that if the molecule is in a specific state, the probability that it will end up in another state a short while later. We have done that. And remember, this is the same protein, the villain headpiece that scaled, I think it was to 256 cores uh, in 1998. You can take a super small protein like this, but because I run many simulations here, I can run say two or 300 independent simulations and easily use a few thousand cores, five or 6,000. And these simulations, they're short. 
they're gonna complete in four hours. But when I do this with Markov state modeling, I can let the computer optimize everything automatically. I don't need to pick the parts of phase space to sample manually. So this small system that is roughly 8,000 atoms, since I can run that effectively on 6,000 cores, that I means that I have scaling to 1.3 atoms per core, which is like a factor 100 better than I can ever imagine doing it with my actual algorithms. The other cool thing is that what happens after less than half a day, uh, the white state is the native one from the experiment, but after less than half a day, the computer says that not only did we, I, not only did we reach the white state, but the computer can say that the red state is not quite identical, is the one that is predicted to be most stable without any information whatsoever about what the true experimental state was. And that was not true 20 years ago, because 20 years ago we cheated and we stopped the clock when we hit the white state. So molecular simulations are actually good enough now to literally fold proteins. It's probably not the way you would predict protein structure, but that means that we can predict what's happening. And for instance, if there is a mutation here, how is that influencing the protein? And there was a beautiful paper by a colleague in uh, eLife just a few weeks ago. So this is John Shadera, who has used Markov state models to simulate methyl transferases. So these are small proteins evolved in several uh, cancer uh, diseases and uh, several forms of cancer, and they modify other proteins. And their hypothesis is that certain mutations in this protein will preferentially stabilize some conformations, but not others. And what they then could do, they used, I think, 10,000 different simulations in parallel, and they started a ton of different mutations and everything. And what they could then do, not only could they show movies, but they could actually show with statistical certainty that some, oops, sorry, that some of these states, let's see, that some of these states have become more stable, and you see in the lower one there, when we have a small molecule bound, that tends to stabilize some of the states that are less visited in the, the so-called APO form, the one that doesn't have it bound. But the amazing thing is that this we can do for hundreds of mutations. All the mutations that MSKCC has found to be related to cancer. And rather than just saying that some of these mutations are related to cancer, we can now actually say why because they tend to stabilize certain conformations. And then you can use that to try to find, can we then find a drug that somehow destabilizes that conformation? So rather than just using simulations as some sort of post-diction that we can understand things that are already known in experiments, we're actually having simulations predict not just structures of molecules, but their entire kinetics and how they move. Uh, and I'm, I'm so super impressed with this. The other cool thing is that they're using machine learning to identify how they should build these models and everything. And the time scales they cover here is several milliseconds, even though the individual runs here. There's not a single individual run that is longer than one microseconds. But by using Markov state modeling, we effectively extend the time scales we can cover by at least three orders of magnitude. So I'm almost done here, but I'm gonna end with a few things because I think this approach has legs. And it's, just, it's used not just in molecular simulations, but in virtually all the scientific problems. And this dawned upon me when we wrote the scientific case for computing in Europe a few, about a year ago. So the most obvious one has to do with any type of predictions, in particular hurricane predictions. What you do with hurricane predictions is that we know that just as molecular dynamics, it's a chaotic process. So you try to alter your initial conditions just so slightly and run many, many, many trajectories, and then you end up with this prime of potential different scenarios. So short term, we know exactly where it's gonna end up, but long term, Sandy here might end up either in New York or go north or south. You can certainly do this with weather prediction too. You can do a, lots of parallel simulations and then try to determine what is, what is the uncertainty here. So rather than just having a number, we can actually apply a standard error just as any experimentalist would do. This works remarkably well. Uh, but the other thing that this does, you can start comparing scientific codes. Because I don't realize not all scientific codes are equal. So Irma and Jose in particular, uh, it was very close that they had to order an evacuation of Miami, right? Uh, and of course, if it's a life death matter, you would evacuate if you're uncertain. But evacuating Miami, I think $500 million is probably counting low. So you, you can't afford to do that every time there is a potential hurricane in Florida in a week from now. And if you start looking at these codes, four or five days out. The best code here, which happens to be a European one, has an average error below 200 kilometers, while the worst one has an error that is 700 kilometers. Like, that's kind of the distance between Miami and Jacksonville. 
And computers are certainly large and expensive and everything, but if you start to comparing running for 24 or even 72 hours on these computers with the cost of evacuating Miami, doing this computers is dirt cheap. But the other lesson here is that as much as we want those computers, we should invest more in A, code development, and B, comparing codes. I'm not sure exactly why this code is so much better, but this, of course, is something that all the codes should learn from, so that all the codes should be as good as the best prediction. We're seeing this in weather prediction, too. This is an initiative that has been started very much in Switzerland, where predicting weather in Switzerland is horribly difficult in contrast to Phoenix, because you have all these microclimates in the valleys. But of course, if you can have accurate predictions, well, 20 days would be awesome, but in Switzerland, even if you could do it accurate for 10 days, that has major implications for agriculture, tourism, and production, if you can make sure to harvest the grapes before the rain. And what's happening in Europe that I'm somewhat enthusiastic about that, that as part of this EuroHPC project, there is now almost 10 topical centers of excellence where we're getting the scientists involved together with computing experts and code experts and everything and focusing, for instance, on fluid dynamics, life sciences, personalized medicine, weather prediction, materials, or energy-related research. And I think this works really well because the scientists are the ones that own the problem. The scientists must be there to keep all the research, or all the programmers focused on what the real goal is. But this is a way for them to get help from outstanding experts, and a few of these cases have resulted in tremendous, both scientific and actual impact. And the final part, is, of course, has to do with energy. Uh, perovskite solar cells. Uh, solar cells is obviously something we would like to use in Arizona in particular, right? The problem with the solar cells is that we know that perovskites are great. They have outstanding efficiency but they wear out. They wear out very quickly, uh, and they need lead to be reasonably stable. And lead is good for many things, but it's not environmentally friendly. And if you're looking just at the efficiency improvements here, give this five or 10 years, and based on quantum chemistry, we will have efficient perovskite solar cells that don't require lead. What you have up here is a Swiss Swedish company, ABB, uh, designing high voltage cables. It's also, it might seem remarkably unsexy. But what people are using here, they're using molecular simulations to design better insulators. And with better insulators, you can increase the voltage from 100 kilovolts to 500 kilovolts and now up to over one megavolt. And the higher the voltage is, the lower the losses. And that means that we can, in the future, you might be able to take energy from Arizona and send it to, say, Alaska or something where you need basically be able to transport energy. Because today, that's one of the main reasons why we can take energy, say, from Sahara and use it in Sweden. So with that, I'm almost done. Um, on the one hand, many of the things I've said are positive. I think we are getting way better at using computers, but there are also some very tough messages here. The free lunch here is completely over. You're not gonna get faster computers, and if worse, it's not gonna become faster, they're gonna become slower. So people like me, I only told you about my good codes. Sadly, I also have a large fraction of very bad codes that are single-threaded. And these single-threaded codes, they now run slower for every generation of supercomputers that come out because the core performance is going down, the clock frequency is going down. You don't really see that now because we still shrink the, the architectures are still shrinking. Um, we had a bit of a hiccup around 14 nanometer. I have no idea how well 10 nanometer is gonna work, but the point is that we're seeing the end of this. We will see seven nanometers, potentially five, and I would guess that five nanometer is gonna be it. Uh, at some point, we're gonna bump into the laws of physics, but earlier than that, we're likely gonna bump into the laws of finance that Intel will not, it's gonna be so costly to develop the next generation lithographies that it's simply not worth it for the small performance improvements you're gonna be getting. And this is worse, because even GPUs, as amazing as the accelerators have been, that development has also come from having more and more transistors on the chip, and we're not really, we're not really gonna get those transistors. So as amazing as the accelerators are, you're gonna to need to move to completely different architectures, likely within 10 years. And that scares me a bit, because we're nowhere near being able to do good work even with accelerators. The other final thing I wanna comment on is that for us it was mostly, we liked being open, and uh, to tell the truth, that we didn't get any license income for our code, so we made these codes open source 20 years ago. The more I see of this development and how difficult it is, the more I believe in the importance of open codes. There was a very sad uh, event of uh, David Chandler, who died unfortunately a few years ago, that there was a bit of war over super cold water where two groups was fighting about this for over seven years. And after seven years, it eventually dawned that this was a small bug in the Chandler code, and this was a code that I had not been willing to share. 
So as this because codes become more and more complicated with accelerators and everything, we need to get better at looking into each other's codes and testing them. Uh, because as the hardware out there is amazing, the sad part is the scientific software is nowhere near there yet. Um, on the other hand, if you're a young person in this field, that means that there is a whole lot of potential to improve because my generation didn't really do our homework here. So with that, um, to sum things up, that if there's one thing I would like to emphasize here, spend the time on the algorithms, love your algorithms, but also don't be married to your algorithms. Throw out the algorithms that my generation produced because most of them are not good for modern hardware. Uh, think accelerators, not so much because they are accelerators, because that's how all modern hardware is going to look like. Uh, and you will likely have to move beyond accelerators within 10 years. Uh, but the other part I would like to stress is really this. If you're a young person in this field, you can do miracles, even if it's not your own code. But you can't do it in an afternoon. To find an application problem, work with an application group, or pick one yourself, and you will likely be able to have a tremendous impact. Um, I, realized, I did the math years ago. I think my, my code gets 20 citations per day. So once per hour, there is a paper published with my code. And this is long since today. I'm not, it's no longer improving my age index and everything. But to me, this gives a bit of a sense of purpose. Uh, what I do in a day-to-day -day basis is meaningful to some other people. And as dead as traditional scaling is, I think that we have lots of exciting things coming up when we're simply accepting that we can't scale the traditional way. We have to go all in on ensembles. And the one final thing to remember is that the chemistry lab doesn't look like this anymore. Not even, I don't have a single, I have a large experimental lab, but I don't have a single person who stands there 100%. But even our experimentalists increasingly sit in front of computers, and we're seeing an entire new generation of experimentalists that use A computers and then B robots, but they don't necessarily stand in the lab themselves. And it's certainly going to be a change for chemistry, possibly more so than for computer scientists. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I would love to take any questions. So we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Uh, please come to the mic and say your name. Vivek Sarkar, Georgia Tech. Eric, thanks for a great talk. Um, I know in molecular dynamics, people have also over the decades tried to build special purpose hardware, Grape, Anton, mm -hmm. and now we're entering an era where mainstream, uh, mainstream hardware vendors are talking about having dozens of different kinds of accelerators. Do you see some opportunities for domain-specific hardware, maybe even something far out like analog computing or something that optimizes Markov state Had process. you asked me five years ago, I would say no way. Because even Gromax was, Gromax was a chronic machine for chemical simulation. We gave up on the hardware 20 years ago because we realized how fast general purpose processes are developing. But as I say, the, the problem is that we're coming up to this brick wall of physics, right? And we pay a lot for programmable hardware. And Anton is very expensive, in particular to develop, but at some point, dedicated application-specific circuits will be able to go beyond the physical limits of programmable hardware. I don't think it's gonna be something you have in every lab. It's too expensive and too limited because it also means your algorithm is encoded in the silicon, right? You can't change your algorithm if you have a smart idea. But using it for some of the initial sampling and then augmenting that with, uh, well, seeding your Markov state models, for instance, or something, I definitely see a role for it. But Thank it's going to be very expensive to develop. Thank you. Let's go ahead and thank Eric for his excellent talk. <laughs> and now uh, General Chair Vivek Sarkar will make a few closing announcements. So good afternoon. Once again, I'm Vivek Sarkar from Georgia Tech, and I would like to just share some very brief closing remarks. Uh, it's hard to believe that it was only five days ago that we had the Turing Lecture in this space by Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, because so much has happened since then. And uh, the, there was a general high energy level throughout the conference that your participation has contributed to. Uh, I, for one, have taken away many topics that I want to share with my colleagues when I uh, get back from the talks, even from Eric's talk today, and I hope your experience has been the same. So I would just really like to conclude by acknowledging the hard work of everyone, all the people who contributed to the success of FCRC, 
On Sunday, I was able to thank Donna Capo, who led the entire administration team. Uh, and today, I would like to especially thank members of the executive events team who have been working on site, pre event, on all aspects of all our plenary talks, conferences, tutorials, workshops. So they are Ashley Maroon, Brenda Ramirez, Reagan Robertson, Kristen Rothweiler, Rose Shapiro, Jill Scuba, Morgan Wick, and of course their fearless leader who's running things off stage, um, Shannon Killian. So let's give them a round of thanks. And then all of you on the conference committees uh, put in several months of effort leading up to the FCRC programs, which was absolutely critical uh, for the success and quality of the papers over here. And your input also played a key role in shaping our plenary speaker program. Uh, so on that note, I would also like to offer a big round of thanks to Mary Hall, our FCRC plenary speaker chair, for putting together an amazing lineup of these plenary talks. So thank you, Mary. <laughs> and a thanks to all the plenary speakers who accepted our invitations, and also to Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun for picking FCRC as the venue for their Turing lecture. Um, and finally, thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, I, you know, your participation is ultimately what makes the conference a uh, success. So I hope you really enjoy the last set of sessions this afternoon. Safe travels back. And we look forward to a great uh, FCRC get together again in 2023. So thank you.